I think the first Europeans who came had very different visions. Uh, in the beginning, there was a real lack of understanding of what the place was, what its dimensions were. So that exploration is uh, an ongoing process, and it's a process that's going to go on until the 19th century. And that's a concept that uh, one needs to keep in mind. Different people saw different things. The early Englishmen who come over see something different from the Spaniards. Uh, the Spaniards see a, an area where they can gain wealth. Uh, they're looking for gold and silver, other commodities that they can put on the ships and, and take back with them. Uh, Cortez uh, shifts that paradigm and uh, creates plantations and sort of settlements. And the English come over with a notion of, initially, doing what the Spanish had done. Virginia is supposed to be a place where gentlemen can come over, uh, go out and find uh, gold and silver, put it in their bags, uh, get on the next sh ship sailing back to, uh, to London and uh, settle down with their fortune. Um, that changes uh, by 1630 when Massachusetts Bay is settled. And the notion there is that whole communities come over. Uh, and that's the real difference in Massachusetts Bay, entire communities, not simply families, but whole communities. And there really is the sense of creating a new England. And people are familiar with the notion of uh, the Puritans and the idea of creating a place that's uh, going to be better than the old place, which is having problems of urban overcrowding and un unemployment and uh, moral decay and decline. Well, the city on a hill is a notion that grows up, but there are at least two kinds of notions. One is the sort of notion that's developed by an intelligentsia who begins to write about this place and begins to uh, create a vision, or visions really, of what it might be for mankind. That is, taking uh, a large view of social redevelopment and history. And so they are beginning to see this wilderness, this place that's untouched, a place that is pure, and can allow the further development of, of humankind. And, of course, that view is flawed in the notion, basic notion that the place is untouched. There are human civilizations living here, societies uh, here already. The people who actually are doing the settling, uh, not writing the grand stories, uh, I think see a more limited vision of opportunity for themselves and their families, a place where they can uh, be free from some of the things that uh, had aggravated them uh, in uh, Great Britain and elsewhere, um, and a place where they can uh, develop to be the persons they'd like to be, the families they'd like to be, the communities they'd like to be. Absolutely, there's a harsh reality. Uh, if we look at the original Jamestown settlement, uh, it's more than decimated. Um, people are dying uh, right and left. It's, it's not an exaggeration that uh, the uh, Native Americans uh, in the area come and save the colonists. Uh, Thanksgiving is a holiday uh, that is not so much about uh, getting fat as it is celebrating survival. So there's a very harsh reality, uh, both in Virginia and uh, in New England with the, the Pilgrims and then the Puritans. Uh, New England winters are, are harsh, or can be very harsh. Uh, so the mere act of settlement is, is a feat that we sometimes don't have uh, an appreciation of. Uh, chopping down the trees. Clearing land for farming is a task that takes a tremendous amount of labor, from getting the stones, boulders, rocks uh, moved out, uh, Anyone who's ever uh, removed a stump, whether from a backyard or someplace else, under, should be able to understand the tremendous amount of physical labor that was involved. And uh, further, there's the, the fact that you don't have those luxuries that you had uh, earlier. Um, labor is the key to wealth. Labor is the key to the growth of the Americas uh, as a society. And there are basically two ways to proceed. One is uh, what becomes the New England or Massachusetts model, where whole families, communities are brought over. And, and the labor system really becomes a family labor system. Families are fairly large. Uh, people are working family farms, family businesses, family shops. From time to time, they'll hire uh, a hand or two to help 
Um, they pull together, they do community bond raisings and other communal activities. Uh, the other plan that evolves is one of finding labor someplace. And where is labor to be found? Well, labor is to be found among the unemployed of uh, English cities and, and other places. Uh, those persons uh, become indentured servants, uh, working for uh, two to seven years uh, on average. Um, Native Americans are uh, enslaved. Uh, that is, they're, they're captured and forced to work for indefinite periods. And then, of course, uh, Africans are imported to work for uh, indefinite periods. As the colonial period is a period where labor is scarce. And labor is scarce against the, or in the context of uh, opportunities that are available. People see vast lands to be cultivated. They see vast lands to be developed. Uh, natural resources, uh, huge timber stands, uh, teeming rivers. Uh, who is going to pull in that wealth? And uh, labor is the absolute key to that. And so that uh, indentured servants uh, initially, and then increasingly uh, Africans. Uh, well, there are probably Africans uh, in the Virginia colony before that famous ship that uh, John Ralph notes uh, in his journal in 1619. What uh, the Africans are seeing is a, a, a wilderness, um, uh, forested uh, plains, um, teeming uh, uh, waters. Um, they've come to a place that's undeveloped in the way that Europeans envision that development. Uh, and they're put to task immediately in the same way that Africans are uh, in what becomes Manhattan, uh, to cut the trees. Uh, to pick up the stones, to move the boulders, uh, to level land, uh, put crops in, fetch water, uh, fish, hunt, uh, to do all the necessary and myriad labors uh, that settlement and society demand. Well, in terms of time, yes. That is, uh, by 1619, uh, the Caribbean colonies, which have been pioneered by the, the Spanish, um, have a uh, hundred years of, uh, of development uh, underway. They have some settled patterns. Um, they're beginning to move ahead. Um, they've found a crop that they think uh, uh, is going to be profitable, and that's going to develop into uh, the huge sugar plantations. So the regimes, um, the social structures are more settled in the Caribbean at, at the the time that we're speaking, so that if one had been dropped off uh, on uh, a ship in the Caribbean, uh, one would have gone into a more settled pattern than would be the case if, uh, if you were on that ship in 1619 uh, in Virginia, where people are, are really still trying to sort out exactly uh, how things will proceed. Or to put it differently, there's much more fluidity. There's fluidity everywhere in the Americas, and what one needs to keep that constantly in mind. But there's much more fluidity in uh, Virginia in regard to the labor situation, in regard to African Americans, uh, than there is uh, in the Caribbean. Well, it, what Anthony's life was like in the Caribbean was uh, probably much more circumscribed, much more confined. He comes to uh, Virginia, finds um, uh, a society that is just developing. Uh, he's getting in on the ground floor, as it, as it were. Um, I don't know if he was able to immediately envision that there would be opportunities for him here that uh, weren't available elsewhere. I don't know that anyone could have foretold that. Um, Johnson's story becomes, though, something of an exception in, in that um, uh, he demonstrates first that slavery is not lifetime tenure, it's indefinite tenure. The key is not you, that you're going to be a slave from the day you're born until the day you die, because after all, slavery is a status. It's not inherent in any individual. It's a relationship with others and a relationship recognized by the society. And the key to it is that it's indefinite. You are a slave until someone who has authority over you declares you no longer to be a slave in the eyes of the the practicing society and in the eyes of the law. So Johnson uh, works his way to the opportunity to become his own person, as it were, to leave behind him that status of slave. 
And then he goes on to do what he sees uh, his neighbors doing. He seeks to get his own piece of ground, his own piece of land, to cultivate some foodstuffs, to cultivate some foodstuffs that he can sell to others, not only to consume, but uh, to enter into uh, the economy, to, uh, to barter, uh, to argue with his neighbors about their encroachment on his lands, encroachment on his rights, uh, to argue about his contract rights. Um, what he demonstrates is an early fluidity that exists. And what that reflects is that there is vast opportunity and a relatively small population to take advantage of that opportunity so that people aren't confining everybody immediately to a niche. The areas are rather broad and they allow movement in and out. Um, I think so. Um, I, the, um, Johnson, I think, certainly had a sense that while he was able to do some of the things his neighbors were doing, getting his own piece of ground, cultivating his crops, getting a family, taking care of them, seeing them grow and flourish, that there are boundaries that confine him that do not confine his neighbors. And those boundaries are boundaries of class, but also of race. I think that he certainly recognizes that he's like people who don't have the opportunities that he does. Uh, he's mindful of the fellows with whom uh, he worked in, in the fields and elsewhere who remain bondsmen. Um, but he's able to do some other things. The fact that he's able to do so, some other things, that he can get mine own ground, does not remove him from being an African. He is Anthony Johnson, the African. Um, and it seems to me that in some of the, the contests that he has where he uh, is standing up for his, his rights, whether in contract or an encroachment on, on his uh, land, uh, fighting trespasses and other things, that uh, part of that, uh, I think, is about um, people seeking to take advantage of him because of who he is and who he is is uh, an African. He's not uh, an Englishman. He's not a European. Well, the question of being an African is an interesting question in, in that um, blacks in the Americas do come from time to time to describe themselves as Africans. And so uh, in a time uh, soon to come, you know, we'll have African churches. Uh, that is, churches who take in their name the word African. But in another way, African is a projection that uh, we, coming later in history, we looking back, impose on these persons. Um, it reflects the removal of these people to the Americas and their developing an identity. What it means to be an African uh, is uh, different on several levels. The first thing to recognize is that uh, in 1619, 1690, 1720, uh, when a person who's been captured and shipped over to the Americas gets off the boat, uh, he or she is not identifying himself or herself as an African. The notion, this identity of being an African, is something that uh, they are going to develop from their interaction with others as they seek commonality. When they're getting off the boat, they're seeing themselves uh, in terms of their, the communities from which they were wrenched. They're seeing themselves as Mende or Temne. Uh, they're seeing themselves as Igbo or Fulani or Hausa. On the boat, they may have been mixed with uh, persons from other ethnic backgrounds, and they're beginning a commonality that's going to develop from this common experience. As they get over to the Americas, they're going to broaden that community. And as they broaden that community, this identification of being an African develops, because it's what they share with their brothers and sisters. Their common ancestry is Africa. That is their homeland. That's what they share together. So African develops in that perspective. 
But also, there's another perspective. There's the perspective of an identity that's thrust upon them. The other part of that is that there's an imposed identity. The Europeans look upon these people and they project an image on them. They project an identity, and that identity is African. To, what that means is non-American. What that means is non-European. What that means is separation. So that the identity of African has at least two sides to it. One side is an affirmation of commonness that proceeds from the people themselves. The other side is the projection of a separation, the projection of a difference, which comes from uh, Europeans. We're not sure what's in Anthony's mind when the tragedy uh, befalls his household. Uh, you know, he gets burned out and, and his possessions are lost and part of his crop is damaged and the rest of that. So we can't know what, what he was thinking. But from the records that we have left, uh, it is at least uh, understandable that he's not quite sure how this tragedy has befallen him, what the source is, whether uh, someone who is, is jealous of the strides that he's made, someone who's jealous of the new status that he is enjoying, or whether it is uh, just an accident. Uh, he's not, he's not clear on that. But uh, there is at least the suggestion that uh, he's thinking that um, there were some uh, ill-minded folk uh, behind that. What's happening to Anthony Johnson, what's happening to Virginia, uh, really the Jamestown settlement uh, that is, is spreading out to become the Virginia colony, is that society is growing. The population is growing. There's more pressure on land and resources. There's more competition for ownership. There's more competition for jobs. There is now a better understanding that the colony is going to grow further. And there is a need not so much to proceed by practice and custom, as has been the case uh, in many areas up to this point, but rather to move into the area of the brighter lines of law. So what ha begins to happen in the 1640s is that uh, those who are controlling the Virginia colony say to themselves, well, we see clearly that this practice of enslaving Africans is going to go further. It's going to grow. The fluidity that we've seen in the past, the fluidity that has allowed an Anthony Johnson to serve less than a life term, to acquire his own piece of ground, to develop a free status, is not something that we want to project as going further in the future. We want to close down that opportunity. We want to begin to show some distinctions. And we want to codify that. And that's what's happening in the 1640s. And it's going to go further uh, into the 1690s and the turn of the century. And so that the labor force is going to become increasingly dominated by Africans and African Americans who are enslaved and who will be slaves, most of them, for life, as was the case for uh, Anthony Johnson's uh, peers. Well, certainly part of the shift that's going on in the Virginia colony uh, in the 1600s is a shift from uh, a labor market that's dominated by indentured servants who are Europeans who have contracts and who have recognized rights in the society, and Africans who have no contracts, who are not indentured servants, but who are slaves. They are captives forced to be where they are in the status that they are. They are going to come to dominate the labor market. Part of the reason they come to do that is not because the labor pool that has supplied indentured servants uh, has run out, but it's rather the difficulties that have been recognized with that labor pool, the runaways, um, and also a recognition that these whites who have come over as indentured servants, after serving their two or seven years, become free persons who are going to compete on the same basis uh, 
with others uh, in the colony. So that there is a real focus on the issue of control of labor, which is not an issue that's confined to the 1640s. It's an issue that runs throughout uh, human history. And so slavery uh, begins to develop as a way to control a labor source, as a way to have predictable labor supply. The case of John Punch is uh, a, a case which signals bright lines which have developed in the Virginia colony, distinguishing the indentured servant from the slave. These runaways uh, who've gone off and been recaptured are to be punished. Well, what's the punishment to be? Clearly the crime is the same. They've committed it at the same time in each other's presence. They've been captured at the same time. So if we talk about doing the same crime, getting the same punishment, here's the case where we should be able to see that. Well, what happens is that the law says, well, these persons who are indentured servants, these Europeans, are under contract for a particular term of service. Their punishment shall be adding to that term of service. This person who ran away, who is a slave, is serving for an indefinite term. There are no years to be added to that. So that person standing in that status cannot receive the same punishment as those standing in the indentured servant status. They must receive some other punishment. And that punishment in this particular instance is to be uh, whipped. Uh, and there, there is the clear indication of a primary distinction between service for a specified term of years and service for an indefinite tenure. In the 1640s and 1650s, there's a clear difference among groups. Uh, race is perhaps a concept that uh, is going to come later as uh, we know it today. But there is clear group identification, and there are a variety of groups. The English aren't the Scotch, the English aren't the Irish, the English aren't the Welsh. Uh, the Africans are, uh, are separate unto themselves as non-Europeans. Uh, they're sometimes referred to as non-Christian, although that's not necessarily so. Uh, there are Africans who, when they are captured, have already been baptized uh, into Christianity. Uh, the sense of difference is growing in the workplace, in the distinction between indentured servants and slaves in regard to tenure of service. Uh, the clear element is that the indentured servants are going to be persons who are going to work for a specified period of time uh, under contract. Uh, slaves are without contract. They are captives. So it's without consent and without contract. Um, the slaves and the indentured servants and other whites, whites who are not indentured servants, are doing much of the same work, many of them. So in the field, uh, in the shops, uh, slaves who are working at blacksmithing, for example, or working as coopers, are doing the same work as others. The distinctions don't lie there. What's occurring, though, is that while Slaves may have some common cause with those who are indentured servants and with uh, some white workingmen in regard to how their employers are treating them, that is, the conditions of work, whether they have the proper tools and uh, things of that sort. The Africans are clearly distinct in the sense that they are occupying a particular status that is separate by custom and by law. Because the practice of enslavement, the practice of holding these persons as captives, holding them against their will, having wrenched them from the place of their birth, has marked them as separate and distinct. The fact that they are sold as chattel marks them as separate and distinct. They are not indentured servants, and they certainly are not free persons. And even when they leave the status of being slaves, they are not like the others. Anthony Johnson can go forward and enjoy some aspects of life in the Virginia colony, acquiring land. But no one confuses him.
with his European neighbors. So while the workers are in a position working, there's a common cause. There may be a common resentment against the controlling classes, because there are clear distinctions and differentiations there. But there still is not a confusion. The indentured servant recognizes that he or she is not an African and is not to be treated as an African and will not tolerate being treated as an African. And the African who is enslaved does not have the rights and privileges, the means of protest. When we talk about differentiation, what we're talking about is identification, another side of that. And one of the issues that's developing is, how do we tell who's who? Who is who? Part of what's going on, for example, is that uh, you have early distinctions between Christians and non-Christians. And then what happens if someone is baptized? So that as we go forward, uh, Virginia, Maryland, New York will pass laws saying that uh, though an African convert, the conversion has no effect on his or her status. What this symbols is the issue of identification. How do we know who's who? The miscegenation laws are part of that in the sense that if we allow this mixing, if we allow a person who has one parent who is European-American and one parent who's African-American, well, what will that person be? What will that person's identification be? But more than that, no how the miscegenation laws are worded. They really are laws that seek to impose control, not merely in regard to race, but in regard to gender. Because they're laws that are aimed at white women begetting offspring by black men. That's where the real punishment comes in. And there one might note that the line of succession for slaves by law is defined in opposition to the line of succession for the European or white population. That is, for the white population, succession, inheritance, follows through the father. It is paternal. Among those occupying the slave status, succession, there is no inheritance because there is no property by law, but it runs through the mother. One of the things to recognize in regard to slavery is that it is an ever-changing element. Slavery is a relationship between and among persons. It's a relationship recognized at law. It's a relationship that exists within the context of a society. And one need to remember that it's not an individual enslaving another individual. It's a society enslaving an individual by custom and or by law. So that as we talk about slavery, we need to recognize that this is an evolving element. It's an evolving institution. It's ever-changing. It has many faces. It has common elements throughout. When we look at South Carolina, what we see in the North American context is a colony that begins to develop along the Caribbean line. Now, what is that exactly? Well, South Carolina takes for itself uh, elements that have been developed in the Caribbean island of Barbados. The distinctive issue is that in the Caribbean, African peoples dominate the population. They are the majority. South Carolina comes to be such a colony. Sixty out of every 100 of the colonists by the 1700s, certainly by the mid-1700s, is a person of African descent. Now, Virginia is a place that's not far behind. I mean, if we look at Virginia at, uh, in the middle of the 18th century, about 43 of every 100 persons of African descent who live in the English colonies of North America live in Virginia. What marks South Carolina as different is that blacks are the majority. 
as Peter Woods, the historian Peter Woods said so well in his title, black majority. That's the history of colonial South Carolina. What that means in regard to the shape of uh, the social institution, what that means in regard to the confines of slavery, is that where an Anthony Johnson at the beginning of the 17th century in Virginia was one of a few among more whites and had some opportunity to move about, had some fluidity. The Africans in South Carolina are a majority. There are fears that immediately develop in regard that there are so many of them. We cannot not allow them to have certain kinds of freedom, certain kinds of mobility. We must shut down uh, certain elements of fluidity. We must close off certain routes from the beginning, from the outset. So South Carolina develops one of the harshest slave codes in the American colonies because it is back to social control. There being in the majority, a stronger element of social control must be put in place to confine them, to keep them in place. The relationship between uh, Europeans and Africans in early South Carolina or in the Carolinas before the, the separation is one of give and take. It's one of uh, mutual growth in a sense. That one needs to recognize that uh, Africans are brought into South Carolina developing uh, rice as the principal crop of South Carolina in large part because Africans know rice growing. They are brought in to bring their knowledge and expertise to bear. They know more about rice growing than the European planters who are enslaving them. So they're brought over to teach, as it were, their techniques, their methodologies. In terms of their experience with the uh, environment itself, uh, some of the Af many of the Africans who are brought over are familiar with uh, uh, that sort of uh, tropical uh, climate with the, the heavy humidity, the, sw the swampy areas. Um, there are also uh, elements of epidemiology that uh, various people have, uh, have mentioned that uh, Africans uh, seem to have had more exposure and had built up um, some uh, immunity to, uh, to certain kinds of problems. Uh, the mortality and morbidity don't necessarily uh, bear out um, uh, the fact of, uh, of this difference. Uh, but there is certainly the sense that uh, Europeans coming to South Carolina, looking, and f looking at the place, feeling the conditions, uh, are not eager uh, to go out and test themselves against the elements and uh, have these captives and their offspring to go out and do that, that grudging uh, labor. Well, the relationship between the Europeans and the Africans uh, in a place like South Carolina is very definitely a reflection on a power relationship. Uh, and it is physical force. I mean, it's interesting that Europe Europeans here don't have the technical knowledge it's the Africans who have the technical knowledge, the expertise at rice growing, for example. That doesn't translate into power. That is, that knowledge doesn't translate into power. It is the force of arms that translates into power and extracts from the Africans who are doing the labor, who have the knowledge, who expropriates from them the value of that information. The Americas of the uh, late 16th, 17th, 18th century are a place that's hotly contested. The Europeans are vying among themselves for hegemony over particular areas. That struggle and strife is going to go on uh, really until the time of the American Revolution. One of the things that that does is to make life in the colonies for the various populations very unsettled, very insecure. The English colonists who are living in South Carolina are fearful of the Spanish in Florida. Uh, 
they think that the Spanish are going to encroach upon them, take them over. And after all, the English have come and encroached on the Spanish to begin with, so that there is this continual ebb and flow. People in the colonies are very watchful of what's going on in Europe, because what's going on in Europe very directly affects them. If a war breaks out between Great Britain and Spain, then the English colonists in South Carolina worry that uh, Spanish armies and navies will come up from the Caribbean, will come up from Florida. This is a time when the Spanish are losing territory to the British and vice versa. But the British are uh, increasingly dominant. But there is this basic insecurity that is a, an element of life. Add to that insecurity is the question of identification and loyalty and allegiance. To whom do the Africans and the African Americans owe allegiance and loyalty? Are they part of us or are they part of them? Will they side with us or will they side with them? We see them as having grievances against us. After all, we are holding them captive and exploiting their labor. We are impinging on their life. We are standing between them and freedom. It is natural for us then to suspect and to expect that they will make common cause with an enemy against us. So that as foreign enemies gather to the shore or loom in the distance, the English colonists are very much afraid that their domestic enemies whom they conceive the enslaved Africans to be, will rise up and exact a just vengeance. Stono, uh, the Stono Rebellion in South Carolina, uh, develops in a context of hostility between Spain and uh, Great Britain. Um, prior to uh, what's known as the revolt, the year before, uh, a group of uh, blacks made their way from South Carolina into Florida. Uh, the Spanish governor of Florida welcomed them, uh, gave them lands, uh, essentially did a nice little publicity release uh, saying, you see these persons are, are fleeing the, the English, see how bad the English are. But more than that, what he did was to issue a proclamation to induce others from South Carolina to follow this path, to unsettle the uh, English in, uh, in South Carolina. And what occurs then is that um, there is a, a sense that perhaps more Africans, more African Americans will follow this path. Uh, they seem to be more testy. They seem to be more unruly. And then uh, what occurs uh, in South Carolina with the Stono Rebellion, uh, with this uh, large group of African Americans who uh, actually shed white blood, burn plantation houses, move in a body uh, southward, uh, frightens the population by realizing the specter that they'd long envisioned. They've made it real. They've made the blood run, the rebels have. And uh, vengeance is sought for that. Now, I think that the, the Africans are no more or less brutal than one would expect in such circumstances. Uh, they cut some throats. Uh, they burn down buildings. Um, I mean, there's no ritual mutilation or anything of that sort. Uh, they don't exact the kind of uh, vengeance on uh, whites that whites do when they've uh, captured the rebels. The whites uh, cut off heads and hang them uh, on posts. So, uh, no, I don't see anything uh, exceptional there. One needs to keep in mind that uh, the 17th and 18th century are, from the, a later perspective, a brutal time. Uh, punishments are uh, are brutal. People are are broken at the wheel. They're tied to a wheel. Their bones are are, are broken. Uh, you have your arm broken. You have the other arm broken. You have a leg broken. Uh, your back is broken. 
Um, and that's the sort of thing that, that today I trust would make most of us uh, grimace at, at brutality, but uh, people of an earlier time saw that as, uh, as reasonable and just punishment for transgressions. One of the things that occurs in uh, the English colonies of uh, North America in regard to Africans being uh, brought into the colonies is that various sorts of identifications are placed on groups and often the identifications are in regard to a particular port from which the ship may have sailed so that uh, you get a group of uh, slaves who are known as pawpaws and coming from the, the Grand Po or the Little Po River area in Africa. Uh, when the English are referring to Angolans, uh, whether the persons are actually from uh, an area uh, that is Angola is uh, not always uh, so, and it's not always clear. It may simply have meant that the ship last sailed from Angola. What develops, though, is a sense among uh, Europeans in the colonies in general that slaves from certain areas have particular characteristics. Uh, slaves from the Angola area are reputed among the English to be particularly difficult, to be rebellious. And um, the descriptions of the revolt emphasizing that they're Angolans among this group, they're Angolans in leadership, uh, in part play off of this uh, see I told you so notion that, that these people are dangerous. But there are some other elements um, that suggest that uh, the group did in fact uh, exhibit certain kinds of military behavior uh, in terms of their gathering and retreating and skirmishing that reflected uh, some experience uh, in the Angolan area. In reconstructing events such as the Stone River Rebellion, one of the difficulties is uh, to understand what plan, what vision was in the mind of the Africans and African Americans who were acting these things out. Uh, they do not often get to leave uh, uh, some memoir of, of what they had in mind. What develops from the testimonies that we usually get are some conflicting stories as to whether the sense was that the rebels in, in Stono were going to be able to cut a swath uh, uh, from South Carolina down through uh, Georgia into Florida. Um, one would say that that looks like an unreasonable uh, perspective. Um, they were able to enjoy the success that they did in part because of the strategic moment when they struck on a weekend. Um, uh, without traffic around to immediately alert, alert the remainder of the society as to what was going on. But as soon as it was learned that uh, this group, perhaps nearing a hundred Africans, had massed and armed themselves and actually killed whites and burned plantations, the entire force of English North America was going to come down on them because this was an issue not merely for those in South Carolina immediately surrounding this area. This was an issue for every European colonist everywhere in the colonies to quash this and to provide some exemplary punishment. Part of the issue, though, that's occurring is, or might have been, uh, the rebels expecting, hoping, that some Spanish force would either distract the English colonists. The rebels in South Carolina may have been expecting some Spanish support, either uh, in Spanish maneuvers off the coast because ships, Spanish ships were sighted uh, off the uh, Carolina coast, uh, perhaps threatening uh, Charleston, or uh, some other uh, aid and assistance. But uh, clearly that force uh, of uh, nearing 100 was not going to be able to uh, overwhelm the colony in any way. Uh, the best they could have hoped for was to uh, beat their way into uh, a wilderness area. But it's a long, it was a long way for them to go. Uh, one must then question what success uh, meant. Uh, I would expect that some of those uh, who rebelled uh, had simply had enough and uh, said, uh, 
No, here and no further. If uh, I make it, I live in freedom. If I don't make it, I, I die and I'm, I'm quit of uh, the slavery that I've been suffering. What Stona does is to realize the fear of the Great Slave Rebellion, not only in South Carolina, but throughout the English colonies. So that as news gets out, New Yorkers are worried that uh, the slaves in New York City, a city that has the second largest slave population to Charleston, South Carolina, that uh, they're going to uh, get out of hand, be unruly, that uh, blood will be shed uh, in their streets. And in fact, they have in their history in 1712 an example of slaves rising up, uh, killing whites uh, in the streets. So that here is an example of the nightmare made real, and that's its effect, and uh, the reaction to it is to enact uh, more stringent codes, uh, to have some debate about whether their Africans should be allowed in the colonies, whether South Carolina should continue to rely to the degree that it does on uh, slave labor. Well, New York City, when it gets word of the Stonewall Rebellion in 1739, uh, is uh, very upset, very worried. Uh, not merely uh, about what's gone on with di their distant brethren, but in terms of what may happen uh, in their own households. And the reason that they're worried is that uh, New York City is a place that houses, that holds the second uh, largest population of Africans in any of the uh, urban areas of the uh, English colonies in North America. Um, about one in five of, uh, of the persons uh, in New York City. Uh, is, in, is enslaved. Um, their concern is that they've had a rebellion in their past. In 1712, uh, a group of about 25 or so uh, Africans uh, uh, started a fire uh, uh, about midnight, and as whites came to put out the fire, uh, slayed some and wounded others. Uh, uh, casualty total of about 24, 25, and then fled. They were eventually uh, captured, um, and 24 uh, Africans lost their lives. Stono rekindles the sense that that could happen again, and that occurs in a backdrop where the regime of slavery in New York City is train changing significantly. Uh, in the 1730s, uh, importations uh, into New York uh, City have picked up. And where a pattern had developed in the past that might be described as domestic slavery, a regime dominated by uh, African women uh, working to do domestic chores, the laundry, the cooking, things within the household. Increasingly in the late uh, 1730s, and uh, beginning of 1740, more males are appearing. And they're working not merely at domestic tasks, but they're working in shops. They're working at artisanal labors. They're doing more skill trade, and they're creating more competition. And this is the case in the late uh, 1730s. And there's a petition to uh, the acting governor of, of New York, George Clark, from the white working men saying, listen, something must be done about slaves working in these trades. If they are not restrained, white working men will be forced out of, of New York, and you'll be left only of, with these labors. So there is this concern that's occurring about this shift. And what is most threatening about the shift is not merely the economic side, but the vision of the African-American adult male. The African-American adult male, and here we're talking about someone from 16 uh, to 30 or so, the young adult male, is seen as the most troublesome, the most intractable, the most rebellious. Those are the persons who are growing in the population. Those are the persons the white working men are worried about. Those are the persons who are slipping out at night, going down to uh, the tippling shops. Uh, by law, they're not supposed to be out after uh, sunset. By law, they're not supposed to uh, have any currency of their own. By law, they're not supposed to go and gather in numbers 
uh, of three or greater by law. They're not supposed to be out drinking, yet every night they're out doing all of these things. Uh, some carousing with, uh, with uh, white women, uh, making common cause with uh, white working men and others, talking about how uh, they've all been hard used by the ruling classes, how they're all being exploited. Uh, talking about the news of the day that there's a war going on uh, against the Spanish, the war of Jenkins' ear. Uh, and making common cause, venting off, uh, off steam, uh, making it clear that uh, um, they at least have thoughts that life should be different and uh, are talking about taking action to make life different. Vark Caesar, who is um, a baker by trade, um, his his holder, uh, Jacobus Vark is uh, is a baker, and uh, uh, Caesar is one of his prime hands. Indeed, in, in testimony, Vark says that he never has any problems with Caesar. Caesar is up at uh, at sun sunrise in the morning, uh, stoking the ovens, getting ready to bake the day's uh, uh, products. Um, but at night, Caesar has other things to do, and Vark seems uninterested in restraining Caesar from doing those other things. Vark is interested in Caesar's labor, and Caesar uh, is apparently a, a uh, productive laborer. Um, Vark sees uh, Caesar in one light, as his slave, as his worker. Caesar sees himself clearly in another light. He sees himself as a person who, outside of work, uh, has another life, has other things to do. Uh, he goes down uh, to visit uh, various tippling houses. Among his favorites are uh, one called Hewson's. Uh, the proprietor is a man named John Hewson and his wife Sarah. Another is uh, Rami's, uh, run by John Rami and his wife uh, Elizabeth. Uh, Rami is uh, rather well connected. Um, he's got uh, relatives who sit on uh, governmental bodies in the city and in the colony. Caesar visits these places, which is clearly illegal. He uh, is drinking, uh, making festive, uh, and he apparently has a relationship with uh, a white woman uh, whose name is uh, Margaret Carey. Um, and the rumors are that uh, when she becomes uh, pregnant uh, in uh, late 1740 that she's carrying uh, his child. Uh, Caesar is engaged in a variety of uh, illegal activities uh, based on breaking and entering. Uh, he's been publicly whipped uh, for having a hand in uh, stealing some uh, Geneva gin uh, from uh, a tavern in town. And uh, uh, he's a shady character. Uh, he's a man out on the make. Um, he's reaching out for those things which the society has uh, denied him. Um, keeping in mind that uh, the English colonies uh, in 1740 are not adhering to the calendar that we keep today uh, so that they don't begin their years on January 1st, rather they began their years on uh, March 25th. Um, in what we would think of as 1741, which for them was uh, seven, March of 1740, what happens in uh, New York City in 1741 is that uh, keeping in mind that the English are operating on a calendar where the New Year begins on the 25th of March. Uh, the week before New Year's, uh, the day after St. Patrick's Day, uh, which is a celebration that has come to the colonies and actually developed in Boston and come down to New York, uh, a fire breaks out. And the fire occurs in a place called Fort George. Fort George sits at the southern tip of uh, Manhattan Island and uh, close to the area that we think of as uh, Battery Park. Fort George is the embodiment of the colonial governmental structure in New York. It is the governor's official residence. Uh, it's the main military barracks on Manhattan Island. It holds the armory for uh, the military. It's got the main chapel. It's got a chapel. Uh, it's got the provincial secretary's records, so the land deeds and, and the rest of that. Well. A fire occurs at this place, and it immediately develops into a conflagration. And so that between the time it's first sighted, about noon, and uh, the middle of the afternoon, the whole place is burned down. 
New York City at the time is a small settlement confined to the southern tip of Manhattan Island. That's the whole place. Most of it is wooden structures. And people are absolutely scared to death that the fire that has occurred at this, their major structure, is going to spread to the rest of the town and burn the whole thing down. It's a, really a tinderbox. And it's not an, uh, a silly fear. One needs to keep in mind that uh, much of London, England had burned down in the 1660s. Uh, also keeping in mind the pe what the people in 1741 don't know is that uh, in 1776, much of New York is in fact going to burn down and, and catch fire. But there's this fire at Fort George. It's a major conflagration. It's still smoldering uh, the day after. When it occurs, uh, the people are uh, up in arms. Literally, they're afraid. They don't know what's happened. Uh, the militia is called out and, and uh, keeps order in the streets. Uh, there's panic. People are uh, talking about well, what the cause of this was. No one knows immediately. The week afterward, almost to the day, another major fire breaks out. And then in the next three weeks, there's a series of more than a dozen fires. And they begin to occur with increasing rapidity. And as this series of fires is occurring, people are asking more and more questions. Their fear is mounting. Uh, was the fire at the fort an accident? Well, that could, could have been when it was the only fire. But as this rash occurs, a sense that there is some evil hand behind this develops. And then people begin to look for who exactly is it that's wielding this, this hand. And they begin to see a black hand. Uh, they begin to worry that slaves are behind this, that this is some act of vengeance, that this is some prelude uh, to rebellion. And several things occur. One of the fires takes place um, in next to a residence where one of the enslaved persons is uh, from a, a small group who are known at the time as the Spanish Negroes. And these are persons who were captured aboard a Spanish sloop, La Soledad. And uh, the crew members who were visibly European in characteristics are jailed as prisoners of war, whereas those on the crew who have African characteristics are sold in the Admiralty Court and uh, put out as slaves. And they petition, and one of the things they say is that uh, if you don't set us free as we should be, we're going to burn the place down. And so as this fire occurs next door to Juan Sarley, um, People say, well, you see, they said they were going to burn the place down. It looks like they're doing it. Take up the Spanish Negroes. The Spanish Negroes are taken up uh, en masse and, and put in jail. Subsequently, another fire occurs, and at this fire, um, Quack Phillips is seen fleeing from the scene, and a shout goes up, uh, the Negroes are rising. And in response to that fire and his fleeing in April, a uh, general... Uh, Dragnet goes out, and just about every African-American male over uh, 16 years of age is taken up and put in, uh, in jail, crowded uh, under the, the city hall. Um, what happens then is that an investigation uh, begins, and the investigation is, uh, is going to be spearheaded by uh, a justice of the highest court in Colonial New York, a man whose name was Daniel Ors Mandon sets off a prosecution that's going to go from April to August. And as a result of that prosecution, uh, 13 black men are going to be burned at the stake. 17 are going to be hanged along with four whites. Uh, John Hewson, the owner of the tavern, and his wife are going to be hanged along with uh, Margaret Carey, who was accused of uh, being uh, Caesar's mistress, and uh, an another white, John Urey, who was accused of being a Spanish spy. And the underlying accusation is that there was going to be a slave uprising and the slaves are going to make common cause with the Spanish who were going to invade New York City and take over. Uh, at first blush, that may seem unrealistic, but one might remember that uh, 
Uh, New York City had been taken by the British, in fact, by sailing into the harbor and capturing the city in that way. And the Dutch, during the Third Anglo-Dutch uh, War, had retaken the city. So the notion of a foreign enemy sailing into the harbor to gain control of the city was not at all far-fetched. I think there was real hard evidence, and in, in my book, A Rumor of Revolt, um, what I seek to do is to demonstrate mm -hmm. the underlying reality of the prosecution. I mean, the prosecution moves forward following all the rules of uh, procedure of the time. They take special pains to uh, draft indictments that are correct to the letter, uh, to follow the strictures of the law. The, clearly, the conspiracy that the prosecutors alleged in court, that there was going to be a grand design, that John Urey was a Spanish spy, the evidence of that is not present. But the evidence of the underlying uh, conspiracy, I think, is sound. And what I mean by the underlying conspiracy is that uh, when Caesar and um, Prince and uh, Quack Phillips and Juan Sarley got together um, and engaged in uh, thefts and other elements. Those were conspiracies. A variety of conspiracies occur. Roosevelt's quack confesses to setting the fire that burned down Fort George. I mean, he did that uh, in part as resentment. His wife was the cook for the governor, and the governor forbade him to come visit his wife. And a quack protested and said, that can't be so. I'm, I'm going to come and see my wife. And uh, the governor sent, put sentries out to keep quack from coming in. So quack says, OK, yeah. Um, you're going to keep me from coming to see my wife. Uh, I won't allow that to happen. Uh, so what has happened in the conspiracy is that a variety of resentments in the conspiracy prosecution is that a variety of resentments are taken by the prosecution and balled into one grand element. And that when you see the whole ball, as it were, it seems unreal. That whole ball is not proven. Mm -hmm. However, when you look at the actual trial records, the specific crimes for which the persons are tried and convicted are parts of that. But Caesar, when he is uh, tried and convicted of a particular burglary. Um, that's sound. Okay. Um, I think that there, what we have are competing visions. Mm -hmm. um, among the blacks who testify, you get a competing vision. One simply say they are acting out of vengeance. They want to get back for harsh treatment. Some say that they have a notion that the Spanish and perhaps the French are coming, and with this internal uprising, they'll be able to take over the city, and they're going to stay and rule and dominate. There's another vision that what they'll do is to wreak some havoc in the city. The Spanish or the French will come, and then they'll sail away to safety and freedom. The, the prosecution doesn't have the evidence to prove its grand conspiracy theme. But that's only on one level. On another level, what the prosecution is reacting to is this vision of rebellious, intractable, continually bothersome Africans and African Americans who are enslaved. The conspiracy and sedition against which Osmandon and his, Justice Osmandon and his fellows are moving against is an everyday reality. And what Orsmanden's view is, is captured in the sentence that he authors in his report on the conspiracy. And what he says is that these enemies of their own households, having done once these things, are likely ever again to do them. His vision is that if New York is to go further, what it must do is to rid itself, not of slavery, but of slaves, to make it a white man's land, to make it a white man's place. Because the sedition, the resentment, uh, 
the going out at night, the theft, the drinking and making common cause with whites, the carousing, the interracial play between the Houstons and the blacks, between Caesar and uh, Margaret Carey. These are ongoing, everyday things, and towards Mandan and those like him, it represents the development of a society that he finds scary, a society of which he is afraid, a society of which he is rightfully fearful. Slavery is about the deprivation of self. It is about one not being one's own person. It's about one not owning oneself in a society where property is the basic notion. Slavery is not about being houseless or clothesless. Uh, it's not about being hungry. It's a basic deprivation of freedom and liberty. It's the deprivation of being able to make your own decisions and your own choices. It is the deprivation that is inscribed in a statement that one person is another person's property. That's what one is working with when we talk about slavery, so that it, it's Slavery is a reflection of a condition that has to do with a relationship between a person and another person, between a person and the society. It's not about a sense of deprivation of some particular circumstances. Western society is one that has as a hallmark this notion of property. The acquisition, the holding of property has come to define personhood, personality. What we see in the uh, English colonies of North America in uh, the 17th and 18th century is the acting out of this, is the uh, search for acquisition of property at the development of personality, as the realization of manhood. So it's not accidental that when we look at disfavored groups, look at females, for example, look at slaves, look at outsiders, uh, African Americans. We're looking at people whose access to property is restrained and restricted. One of the uh, great ventures of life for African Americans who began as slaves uh, was to rid themselves of that element of their oppression. Uh, to get beyond that status, uh, working to purchase themselves, working after they'd purchased themselves to purchase uh, their loved ones so that they themselves could become the holders of their own property rights, so that they could be restored to personality and act out a greater element of freedom, recognizing that they still remain confined within the society in which they live because they remained outsiders, although they'd thrown off the status of uh, slavery. What they seek to do once they have thrown off the status of slavery is to recognize, appreciate, and enjoy uh, the other elements of opportunity which others in the society are able to uh, achieve. They would like to have uh, a piece of property. They would like to sustain themselves in a livelihood that um, provides their family with the wherewithal to go forward. They'd like to uh, increase their knowledge and education. The American colonies develop as an area of opportunity, as a land of opportunity. That is a notion that uh, it begins with the earliest uh, of the colonies and runs through uh, the history of what will become the United States. And the notion is that there is a break from that feudal past where one's identity, who one was, was in fact assigned at birth. So there's a movement from what was an ascriptive society, where who you were was ascribed to you at your birth, to an achievement society where you could become a particular person. You were not confined by who your grandfather was, who your father was, what their trades were. You could become whatever it was you chose to be, whatever your talents allowed you to be. But that notion of opportunity is premised on an unconfined freedom.
that in fact does not exist for the entire population, that exists for only a part of the population. That unconfined freedom becomes the basis of a mythology which is reified and realized and held up by particular individuals who are able to go from the bottom to the top as if this was an ongoing and pervasive event. Well, the episode of J Venture Smith's uh, intervention in the argument between his wife and his mistress illustrates several aspects of the society of the day. One of the things it illustrates is the differentiation of uh, gender roles. The male coming in as a dominant power to separate these bickering females. Although Venture is the bond slave, he still operates as a man that is in the role of the adult male to come in and separate these uh, women. On uh, another element, what we see here is an, an argument between the mistress and a slave. And one might say, well, what could they be arguing about? Clearly, uh, the mistress says, do so, and the slave meekly, humbly does so. Well, that was not the case. Uh, we're talking about uh, interpersonal relationships and interactions. Um, Venture Smith's wife is going to speak her mind. She spoke her mind, and clearly her mistress did not appreciate uh, what she had to say. Uh, neither woman uh, apparently uh, backed down, and uh, Venture comes in to play the role of mediator, for which he's, uh, he's later chastised because his mistress's husband then calls him to task. Not the mistress herself directly, but the mistress's husband. Again, uh, evidencing this uh, operation uh, of the gender roles. What the episode with Venture Smith's intervening in the uh, altercation between his mistress and his wife further illustrates is the difference between the public and private dimensions of slavery. And that is, slavery is a relationship between and among persons, but it's a relationship maintained by the society. So there are certain public interests in maintaining the slave in a particular role and having the slave behave in a certain way. But the personal relationship between the person who purports to own the slave, the slaveholder and the slave, that private dimension also requires certain kinds of interactions and calls for certain kinds of interactions. The two overlap in part, but they also diverge. And the situation with Venture uh, illustrates that on the personal side, there are levels of interactions between how, for example, Venture's wife and Venture's mistress are going to interact, uh, whether they find each other amiable or not, um, whether one is always uh, intractable. So we have in the literature innumerable examples of slaveholders writing notes, uh, making protestations about a particular slave not behaving. I can't make her behave. I can't make him behave. They won't do as they're told. Recognizing the personality of the individuals who are enslaved. They do have their own minds. They will exercise their own will. Although the individual exercise of their own minds, the individual exercise of their own wills, does not release them from that social stratum that slavery has uh, imposed, that the society has imposed by declaring those persons to be slave. So the ability to exercise one's will on a particular day or at a particular moment or in a particular cause, being recalcitrant, refusing to obey one's master or mistress doesn't represent that one is able to escape slavery. It simply represents that one has expressed his or her personality. The way uh, Venture interacts with his uh, holder, with Stanton, on this particular issue in regard to Venture's having intervened in the argument between uh, Stanton's wife and uh, Venture's wife uh, illustrates Again, this dichotomy between the public interest or the public sphere and the 
private interest and the private sphere. Stanton recognizes that he individually, although he is the slaveholder, cannot stand up to venture. On a man-to-man -man basis, Stanton is not a match. So he does not directly confront venture on venture's intervention, on the way venture has treated Stanton's wife. What Stanton does, rather, is to stealthily come behind Venture, club him over the head, seek to get the best of him, and find himself bested, because Venture, the bigger, stronger man, uh, throws Stanton off, throws him to the ground, and then does something which one might find fairly interesting. Venture seeks to find a public shield for this private abuse. Venture goes in, to the justice of the peace and says, I'm being abused by my holder. But Venture has no civil standing other than a slave. So what the justice of the peace says is, well, Venture, uh, that's a very interesting story you've told me about uh, this abuse, and it's really too bad that, that you're treated that way, but there's nothing I can do as a public law enforcement official. You don't have any standing in the society. What I'll do on a private level is speak to your holder. Meanwhile, Stanton and uh, his brother come in and take Venture off, and as they're on their way home, uh, set upon Venture, and again find that Venture is the better man. Venture is punished for not submitting to his holder, and he's punished by being sold away from his wife, away from his child. We have a separation. When Venture um, is separated, he has been uh, gathering up a little cache of monies, uh, some of which his holder has confiscated. Um, he goes off not only with the cash that he himself has earned, but with the cash, with part of the cash that his wife has earned. Uh, what agreements they came to among themselves, uh, one <laughs> now can can never know. Um, he is going uh, further in the future to purchase his children, and then eventually uh, purchase his wife. Um, what they have in mind at the moment of their immediate separation, other than the loss and, and uh, heartfelt grief of th this separation, again, uh, one can't know. I expect that Venture was extremely angry. Um, Venture's situation, in part, reminds me of uh, Quack Roosevelt's situation. Uh, in the events that are described as the Great Negro Plot uh, in Colonial New York in 1741. Uh, Quack's wife uh, was the governor's cook. And uh, for whatever reasons, the governor decided um, that Quack could no longer come to the house to visit. And the governor, unlike a, a private citizen, had the uh, army to protect his door. So he had a sentry outside his door to turn Quack away. Uh, Quack comes up one evening, asks for entrance, and the sentry says, no, the governor's given orders that you can't come in. Quack says, well, I'm going, I'm going to come in. Uh, the sentry proceeds to club him uh, with the musket, and Quack takes the gun away from him and, and beats him in the head and uh, goes in anyway. Um, Venture isn't quite faced with that situation, but the issues are the same. There are these familial ties. There is this love which you are being denied. You're being denied to access to the most basic um, elements of, of human existence. And so there's a basic refusal to accept that and a profound regret on not being able to exercise your will to realize um, what ought to be yours. One of the ironies of emancipation for African Americans uh, in the colonial and, and early national uh, period is that materially many were better off before emancipation than after. Before emancipation they had someone with property and standing in the community as their patron to recognize their rights, to have rights vindicated, to protect them. Once they are, in fact, emancipated by manumission, they no longer have a patron. Being separate 
being on the margin of society, really having perhaps no civil status, they're left to fend for themselves. They have uh, no necessary employment. When they were slaves, they had employment with their holders. Uh, they had a household, they had a house. Uh, once uh, manumission occurs, they are entirely on their own and suffer a, a variety of, of snubs. Venture Smith, for example, uh, complains about a civil wrong uh, done him where uh, some property is, is lost. He's charged with it, although he actually was not uh, the one uh, who lost the property. And um, the white person who sues him and wins uh, sort of snubs his nose at Venture and says, yes, uh, I would recognize that you didn't do this, that you weren't the cause of my losing those casks overboard. Uh, but I took your money, and there's nothing you can do about it. Emancipation, manumission, puts the former uh, slave not in a position of person. It simply makes them a free Negro. And a free Negro is not equated with a free person. Um, when one looks at the codes, particularly in the southern slave states, there's a separate code for free Negroes, separate and different from free persons. Well, there's a clear distinction in uh, many states between free Negroes and free persons. Um, in, particularly in the South, there's a code specifically for free Negroes that prohibits their ownership of property, they're working in cer certain occupations, they're living in certain areas. Uh, so one should not confuse the uh, notion that uh, the former enslaved African American on manumission uh, rises to the status where the law recognizes uh, the person as, in fact, a legal person having the capacities to uh, enter into uh, contracts, hold property, and do all manner of other things. Well, what goes on behind closed doors between a husband and wife is always difficult for someone else to say. There are a variety of ways to uh, conceptualize the decision that uh, Venture Smith made uh, to purchase his sons, his two sons, and then his daughter before purchasing uh, the freedom of his wife. Um, one might speculate that uh, Meg, as a mother, uh, begged for the freedom of her children before uh, herself. Uh, the notion of the self-sacrificing mother willing to uh, restrain her, her own desires uh, for the benefit of uh, her children. Another take on that would be that uh, the boys uh, coming into maturity would be able to go out to work and to earn at a rate that would allow future purchase uh, more rapidly. So the notion that Venture would buy his uh, elder son first as a helpmate to uh, enlarge their bankroll, then to buy the next son, uh, providing for a certain progression in their income earning, uh, also has a, a certain rationale to it. But again, uh, how Meg and Venture came to the decision that they would uh, uh, redeem their children, and then Meg uh, is only open to speculation. What it reflects is the reality that uh, prime males are the standard in the workplace, that uh, a woman um, is really marginalized in the labor market. A woman is not a person who is able to uh, go from town to town, go from place to place on her own, and easily find labor. The labor to be had uh, as a hireling or in other areas is really uh, the sort of labor uh, that is physically exacting. Uh, Venture makes a lot of his money by felling trees. Um, he makes a lot of his money on the waterways as a, uh, a fisherman. Um, this is not to say that women uh, cannot fell trees or, or go out and fish, but the labor market of that day is a market in which the standard is male labor. Ventures living um, in colonial Connecticut, for example, along the river, 
uh, allows us to understand the real place that waterways play in colonial life. Uh, the waterways uh, represent locations where colonial settlements are. If one uh, looks at uh, the development of colonial uh, settlements, there are very few settlements that are not going to have access to some navigable body of water. That represents the fact that waterways are the transportation highways of the day. But more than that, waterways represent uh, an important area of the economy. Uh, in uh, colonial um, and early uh, Connecticut, what we see is people still going out whaling. Uh, Massachusetts is renowned for its whaling fleets, but people are going out fishing. They're making a livelihood, not only of ocean fishing, but also of uh, fishing in, in the rivers and streams. So that the waterways are really an artery of life, an important element of colonial society. W when one looks at the well, one is looking at something a little different than the waterways. And what we need to recall is what life was like at the beginning of the uh, 19th century. We're talking about a time without indoor plumbing. We're talking about a time when if you needed water, for the most part in an urban area, uh, and probably on a homestead, you went out to the well. Uh, in an urban area uh, such as New York City, the wells are going to be congregation places. Uh, they become a social set piece. They are places where people meet in part in daily routines as they go out at a particular time for tea water, they go out, out at a particular time to get water for breakfast, they go out at a particular time to get water for laundry. Uh, when one thinks about how many times uh, one is looking for water during the normal day, uh, one understands the importance that the well comes to, uh, to play and also the difficulty. Uh, hauling uh, uh, a five-gallon bucket of water is, is not something that uh, everyone is, is up to. Um, so that rituals develop around the watering hole, uh, as it were. And it's not accidental that we have in the language this notion of the watering hole as a gathering place, as a congregation place, as uh, a social milieu. Venture settles on the Salmon River, and the river is an avenue of commerce. It's an avenue that allows him not only to move his produce or his product uh, from one place to another, but he's going to make money hauling uh, persons. Uh, one can only imagine a river as an actual highway. It's the thing on which other things happen. To be located on a river is essential. It, it is a prime place uh, to have easy access to movement, to have easy access to unloading and offloading cargo. Venture, one presumes at the earliest opportunity, makes available to himself the acquisition of his own ground, to have a piece of real estate, uh, which is a symbol, a tangible element uh, of the achievement of a certain dimension and degree of freedom. Um, land is the commodity. Land is the item that allows a person um, to stand in society and say, in fact, uh, I, am, I am a peer. Um, in many uh, states uh, in the early national period, to vote the premise for that was property holding of uh, a particular level. So that Venture's acquisition of land uh, means that he's on that path, that he has become part of the progress toward achieving a broader, wider, richer uh, dimension of his freedom. Does it mark him as uh, the equal with uh, uh, his neighbors? Uh, no, it does not. As the uh, his experience in, in court uh, demonstrates. The American Revolution sets in flow a various 
uh, a variegated uh, set of, uh, of elements. On the one hand, there is the clear contradiction of this group of persons who are holding another group of persons without their freedom, declaring for their own freedom and independence. And um, blacks in, in Boston and elsewhere announce the clear contradiction here by saying, excuse me, something is terribly wrong here, that you who have designed yourself as patriots would seek to claim your own freedom while at the same time holding us enslaved. Well, again, th there is the basic contradiction that uh, blacks point out between those who would style themselves as patriots declaring for their own independence while simultaneously holding slaves. Um, blacks throw back the rhetoric of the revolution in the face of, uh, of the patriots. What's at stake then is a struggle in which there are a variety of levels and free blacks and slaves are on particular levels in, in that struggle. Venture Smith and his sons are not on the level of George Washington. George Washington's um, vistas, the opportunities open to him, his reasons for engaging are different from those of uh, a Venture Smith or uh, his son Cuff. Um, the question for someone like uh, Venture's son Cuff uh, is what's he being offered? And what he's being offered by a state like Connecticut or uh, a state like New York, Vermont, Massachusetts is a bonus. What the revolutionary governments are saying is, well, uh, we have these lands and we will make these lands available to people who volunteer. Now, initially in 1776, when the question of blacks enlisting in the armed forces of the uh, of the Patriots arose, George Washington and his council adamantly said, no, we will not allow the enlistment of, of blacks, uh, slave or free. And this is in the face of uh, uh, blacks already distinguishing themselves at the Battle of Bunker Hill and, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, George Washington and his council would uh, in time change their minds and uh, by 1778, when the Patriots are sorely pressed for, for manpower, uh, they are offering bounties, uh, and the bounties are land uh, to free blacks uh, and other f free persons, and to slaves, uh, an offer of freedom. And that offer of freedom comes really in the form of a payment to the slave's holder, uh, which will then allow for it in emancipation. Now, in the northern colonies, such as uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts, uh, New York, uh, a split occurs. Uh, slaves and free back blacks are uh, sort of uh, taking odds. Uh, they're interested in throwing their lot in with the winners. Um, so they're trying to estimate whether the king is going to be able to reassert his power and authority over the colonies or whether these upstart patriots are going to uh, be victorious. Uh, in Connecticut and Massachusetts, uh, most of the uh, enslaved African Americans and uh, free African Americans who join in the revolution join in on the side of the patriots. Uh, in New York, that happens outside of New York City. The British uh, hold New York City. Uh, they occupy it throughout uh, the war, so you have a different case there. But in the southern colonies, such as Virginia, uh, a very different scenario develops in that most of the uh, blacks who shoulder arms in the revolution are gonna shoulder arms on the side of the king. Uh, they are then directly fighting for their freedom, fighting against the persons who hold them enslaved. I expect the Cuff is of, of uh, a variety of minds about, uh, ventures of a variety of minds about uh, Cuff's enlisting. On the one hand, I expect that he has uh, some of the apprehension that any father has when a son goes off to battle. Uh, 
um, when you go to war, there's the chance that you don't come back, that, that you die or uh, are maimed in, in some way. But on the other hand, um, uh, Venture throughout his life and in, in the writings that he's left us shows himself to have been an accountant, uh, toting up um, uh, what he gained on this, what he lost on that, uh, what opportunities were available to him. So it, it's, he may easily have seen that his son's enlistment was a chance for his son to enlarge his, his own estate, to have property and gain some standing on his own. And in that regard, uh, he was probably pleased uh, at his son's initiative. Venture doesn't buy indentured servants. What Venture does is to buy slaves. Um, slaves are a method of production. They are labor. They are that thing which is necessary if one is to grow, prosper, and expand. Colonial society is based on the increasing acquisition of these methods of, of uh, production, of having more labor available. Venture acts as his neighbors have in seeking to acquire uh, more labor. He purchases slaves. Uh, he attests to treating them very well and then also attest to surprise uh, when they get up and, and leave him seeking their own freedom. Um, he needed, I think, to think back on the days when he was in their circumstances. Uh, perhaps he felt that if he'd been treated as uh, they'd been treated, he would have had uh, gone a different route. I think what um, Venture was most concerned about and what he was most bitter about was not that those who ran away from him were seeking to experience freedom for themselves. Venture felt that they had cheated him, that he has provided them the opportunity to purchase themselves, to gain their own freedom. And rather than acting out this contract, which would have made them in reality the sort of indentured servants uh, to, to which one might allude, uh, they broke the contract. They didn't honor their side of the bargain. They left him holding the bag, as it were. And that's what he, he was upset about. I, th I think when Cuff, at the end of the revolution, looks out on those who picked the wrong side and who are essentially being punished for being on the losing side, uh, he can thank his lucky stars that he picked the right side, that he was on the winning side. Uh, at the same time, I suspect that um, uh, he recognizes the real benefits that, that have been bestowed on him by accident, as it were, because but for the grace of God, there he went, uh, back to Virginia or back to South Carolina or someplace else um, to toil uh, in slavery. Um, one of the things that, that occurs repeatedly in petitions from blacks, uh, whether in Connecticut or elsewhere, uh, blacks such as uh, Cuff, um, remarking on their service in the uh, War for American Independence, or whatever other war it was, is that uh, the values for which they fought, the elements which they hoped to have been vindicating, were not in fact vindicated that the levels of, of oppression, the levels of differentiation, the segregation, were not lessened by their valiant efforts, uh, by their fallen comrades, by their shed blood. The Constitution ought to have been a disappointment to uh, many African Americans, uh, particularly in the point that it is a document that sanctions slaveholding. Uh, granted, the word slave is nowhere used in the original document, uh, men only occurs uh, in the uh, 13th Amendment. Uh, Venture Smith uh, purchases his two sons, Solomon and Cuffey. Then he purchases uh, his wife, Meg, and then he purchases their daughter, Hannah. I think the Constitution of the United States that was drawn up in 1787 uh, may have said to uh, Venture uh, Smith, Meg, and, and their children that the hopes that they might have had for a new nation uh, that eliminated slavery, uh, 
that recognize the basic humanity and personality of, uh, of every individual was not going to be a reality. That uh, the new nation was based on a notion of uh, subordination, uh, that there was not an escape from this subordination, that slavery was going to be part of the very foundation of the nation. Well, between 1750 and 1800, the things that are the English colonies of North America uh, begin to change rapidly, and the major change is the Declaration of the United States of America in 1776. And so, uh, in 1800, you have this new nation, which has uh, ratified this new frame of government, the Constitution, and is headed off uh, in a particular direction. Life has changed tremendously, not merely from being subjects of the King of Great Britain, but uh, now to being citizens of a state uh, for some persons or being uh, uh, citizens of the United States. And uh, for a person like uh, Venture Smith, for his wife, uh, in 1750, um, uh, they, like others, can't have a vision of what the place is going to be by 1800. George Washington, who's born the same year as Venture Smith, has a has no ability to uh, envision these things. But what has happened as we look back, uh, we can see a divergence between African Americans and uh, other Americans, not including Native Americans. Uh, what's happened over time through the colonial period is that we begin with a period where the differentiations are not that great, but over time they're going to grow larger. When the colonial period begins in the English colonies, the majority of the persons who arrive in the English colonies arrive in some form of bondage. By 1800, there's only one group of persons in bondage. At the beginning of the colonial period, bondage is not merely an issue of race. It's not merely identified by color. By 1800, it is only an issue of race and only an issue of color. The differentiations have confined and constricted African Americans to a particular rung of society a rung that goes beyond the mere status of slave, a rung that really marginalizes them in the society, that sets them apart, that segregates them for all time, not merely for the indefinite tenure of their particular service, but one which really separates them and their progeny from the larger body politic. One of the interesting elements or adventures in Venture Smith's life is uh, when he's about 22, he uh, decides to make common cause with uh, an indentured servant and, and some others, uh, some other indentured servants. Venture decides to make common cause with some indent white indentured servants and, and they run off. Uh, they've been uh, creating a little cache of supplies to sustain them and they take a little boat and, and they go off uh, to Long Island. And uh, one of the indentured servants uh, decides that he's uh, better off if he has all of the goodies. And uh, so he abandons uh, Venture and uh, his compatriots. Um, it's interesting just there to speculate about um, Venture's eagerness to seize on any opportunity of freedom a person who uh, is in his life is going to come to accounting for uh, all of his uh, various moves in, in uh, dollar and cents terms uh, is seeking to recapture his life. And he goes out on this venture and two levels of betrayal set in. One is that seeing that his white compatriot has taken off with all the goodies Venture announces a sickness to his heart about 
uh, sort of making common cause, thinking that he could trust uh, these other persons, uh, and then being betrayed in that way. And it appears that he's beginning to think about his own lot, to weigh the advantages to going out on his own as he has, to becoming a fugitive, or being a slave and working his way out of that in a legally acceptable fashion. What Venture does is to go out and recapture uh, his compatriot who's gone off with the goodies, none of which are, are left. And uh, rather than moving forward in this attempt to seize his freedom outside of the legal lines, as it were, he then betrays the group, uh, at least his compatriot, by going back from whence he'd claim and turning the runaway in. Um, and then going on about his own life. Uh, one might ask, well, what were the options? Well, Venture could have gone off and not pursued um, uh, his uh, runaway compatriot. When Venture caught up with his runaway compatriot and, and found that uh, the cash was uh, all spent and, and gone, he could have just said, oh, well, uh, I made a bad bargain with you. You go on your way, I'll go on my way. Uh, but he doesn't. One wonders whether that evidenced some faith in the development of the social system where he was, whether Venture was saying to himself, perhaps what I should do is uh, go back, uh, be legal, work my way through, and um, then come to a status in which I have a certain security, rather than becoming a fugitive. One can only speculate on that. In the terms of the day, Venture Smith was probably something of a man's man. He grew in stature to somewhere between 6'2 and 6'4. And uh, by the end of his life, uh, he was weighing uh, somewhere around 300 pounds. But the point is that in his prime years, um, broad shoulder, strong back, strong muscle, um, he was a prime hand, which is one of the reasons he had to pay so much for his freedom, because he was a person who could go out and heft those heavy casts, fell those large trees. Uh, um, that is the kind of labor, that's the kind of production that slaveholders were, were looking for. That's what they valued.